most influential, of course, APAC and its Washington Institute for Near East Policy, as you know, as a think tank that has probably had the most direct say in, in terms of the peace process itself uh, and other uh, organizations, Heritage Foundation and so on. So you have all these organizations that move from the extreme right to the center, like J Street that, that was being discussed before uh, this talk. And they all have a different type set of requirements and different ways of intervening. Uh, there are different spheres and players. There's a diversity in the, the pro israel lobby. There's the private sector. And as you know, Adelson was trying to buy a president here, but he's also buying a prime minister in Israel. Um, Moscovich, who bought settlements, who built settlements in Jerusalem. Uh, these are individuals in the, pri the private sector that, ha that have had a direct uh, impact and direct intervention using their money. Uh, Haim Saban, in, uh, as you know, uh, in uh, Brookings, and down to the left, Danny uh, Abraham, who uh, has accompanied the peace process all along from a more liberal perspective. Uh, there are institutions and think tanks, individuals linked to them. The most significant, and you'll hear me talk about him often, not because I like him very much, but because he has been the most persistent, Dennis Ross, and <laughs> in and out, and uh, Martin Indyk and others. Then you have uh, uh, academic and uh, cultural individuals and spin doctors who have been a, a primary force in shaping public perceptions, including, you know, Kraut, uh, Krauthauer, uh, Krauthammer, Dershowitz, I'm sure you're hearing him now, um, Daniel Pipes, there are lots of people who are Israeli apologists and spin doctors. Then you have religious organizations and institutions, self-appointed Israeli apologists and defenders who take the Bible literally, many of them, and this is the extreme uh, Zionist Christian organizations that are extremely dangerous in the sense that they do have a literal biblical exegesis that gives Israel license to do whatever it wants. And one of them told me once, you Palestinians have no right to exist because you're standing in the way of prophecy, of the fulfillment of the prophecy. So I said, it doesn't sound very Christian when you advocate genocide. And then there are toxic organizations, as you know, and they have been very effective in distorting the Palestinian message and reality, like MEMRI, you know, M-E-M-R-I. You should be aware of this. This is the most to toxic organization. It is run by Egal Carmon, who used to be uh, the advisor to the military governor, then he became the advisor to Shamir on terrorism and so on. And he used to interrogate me once in a while. But now he has this organization with, with tremendous funds, and he monitors everything, and then he has access to Congress particularly, but to many decision makers, and he distorts uh, Palestinian utterance and, and uh, anything that is published. We can talk about this later. You have memory, you have NGO monitor that attempts to badmouth all Palestinian NGOs. You have the PM Watch, which is also waiting for any Palestinian to open his or her mouth and uh, they attack. And then you have publications. I'm sure you're hearing more and more about Breitbart, for example, Gladstone. Mm -hmm. These are extreme uh, right-wing white supremacists. Some of them are really anti-Semitic, but Zionist. Very interesting, this combination. Now, they influenced substance, structure, procedure, and priorities and objectives in the uh, peace process. They influenced terms of reference, and they influenced also the players, the, uh, and, and the predominantly the U.S. role in, in the peace process. Uh, I would like to mention that many of the individuals who were associated uh, follow the, uh, what I call, revolving door. They use the revolving door as a charge against Palestinians, that when people are arrested, they are released later. But here, revolving door in terms of their role. Many of them were in the State Department. Huh? And it seems that, uh, like Dennis and Martin, that they do go to the State Department, and then they leave and go to the Washington Institute or another pro-Israeli lobby. Then they come back 
through another door there in the State Department. Now we have uh, people in the White House who are not only uh, lobbyists and advocates, but who are active supporters of settlements. So it's not enough to have settlers in the Israeli coalition government. Now you have settlers in the White House. This is incredible. So they don't need to lobby. They are you know, decision makers, right? So that's what's happening. That, that frames, uh, in terms of influence, the peace process with this revolving door. You, you'd be surprised also that uh, Israel's ambassador, ex-ambassador Dan Shapiro, for example, decided to stay in Israel. Uh, and he's joined the Institute for National Security Studies, which is something that also Dennis joined at one point or another, Dennis Ross. So the, it's interchangeable. You know? Either they are influencing policy or they are making policy. And that's why American policy was so distorted, because they played a significant role in framing and defining the discourse and perceptions, but went beyond that to manipulating the verbal public space. 